Welcome to Online Anesthesia Video of the Week. Today topic is presented by Dr. J. Sarva Vinotini. She has held Gold Medal Award from TN Dr. MGR University. She has vast teaching experience as Senior Resident and Assistant Professor in Ames, New Delhi. She has worked as Senior Consultant Anesthesiologist in Gynecology and Pediatric Anesthesia in Maid International Hospital, Chennai. Her area of interest are Pediatric Anesthesia, Obstetric Anesthesia, Research-Oriented Activity and Passionate about teaching. Hello everyone. Today's topic is ventilators, scalars and loops, the basics. I am Dr. Sarva Vinodhani, consultant anesthesiologist in Chennai. Interpretation of ventilator, graphics and loop is similar to reading an ECG. It can also be considered similar to sending an ultrasound wave because the ad that we sent in via the endotracheal tool acts as a probe and it helps us to monitor the respiratory mechanics and, and it also gives us insights on the real-time pathophysiology of the lung and about the airway dynamics too. We set a few parameters in the ventilator because we want something to happen and what actually happens in, inside the patient is being reflected by the parameters that are shown here. But it is the understanding of the ventilator waveforms and graphics that could explain why things are happening the way it is happening. The respiratory physics and physiology revolves around two main concepts, the resistance and the compliance. The resistance is being determined by the flow of the air through the airways and the compliance is being determined by the distensibility of the lung. So in ventilator of scalars and graphics, we monitor these three parameters mainly, the flow, the volume and the pressure. By monitoring these three things, we try to get an idea regarding the resistance and the compliance using this equation of the motion. So ventilator graphics could either be a scalar or a loop. Scalar means a single parameter is being plotted over time. So it could be flow over time, pressure over time or volume over time. So this is how the ventilator scalar looks like. And what is a loop? A loop is where two scalars are plotted against each other. So it is flow versus volume or pressure versus volume. It is called as a loop because it ends at the same point where it begins. So let us go one by one. So let us first take the flow time scalar. So how is the flow time scalar plotted? Flow is plotted in the y-axis and time in the x-axis. So when the inspiratory valve opens, air is being sent from the machine to the patient. So this is called as the initiation of the breath or the trigger that, that causes the inspiratory valve to open and air to be sent. So this, this is the initiation of the flow. And then a peak inspiratory flow rate is achieved and the flow gets limited there. So that is the ceiling of the flow. And then the expiratory valve opens and the inspiratory valve ceases and the expiration occurs. So now from the from the uh, patient, the flow now uh, occur, the flow now returns back to the machine or to the ventilator. So this is called as a cycling. So the peak expiratory flow rate is generated and the inspiration stops here and the expiration begins here. So this inspiration, this part is your expiration, this is the inspiratory time and this is the expiratory time. Now that we got to know how the flow time scalar is plotted, let us see who, who does all these things. So who initiates or who triggers, who says to the ventilator to give the breath. So this trigger could either be by the patient or by the ventilator. If it is by the, if it is by the patient, we call it as an assisted breath. If it is by the ventilator, we call it as an controlled breath. If it is going to be by the ventilator, the trigger is always going to be the time. So if you're going to set uh, 10 breaths in a, in a minute, and then every 6 seconds the ventilator is going to give a breath or the ventilator is going to initiate the breath. So here it is in controlled breath and the trigger is going to be the time. If the trigger is going to be flow or the pressure, then we call it as an assisted breath. So here the patient initiates that flow or the patient initiates that negative pressure after which the ventilator initiates the flow. So this is called as an assisted breath. So the initiation or the trigger could either be done by the ventilator or by the patient. So now that the initiation is done, who is going to limit the breath? The limitation is always done by the ventilator. And the limitation could either be the pressure or flow. So if it is pressure limited, we call it as a pressure limited breath. 
So wherein once the set pressure is reached, it is the flow is getting limited or it could either be a volume limited or flow limited. So wherein we call this as in volume controlled ventilation or the pressure controlled ventilation. So who cycles now? The cycling is almost always done by the ventilator except in the pressure support mode where it is being done by the uh, patient. So here it is flow cycle. So the initiation, the limitation and the cycling. So all this lead on to this inspiration and the expiration. So now that we saw this inspiration expression, this inspiratory waveform and this is your expiratory waveform. So there's a flow time waveform is a only scalar wherein you have a consistent negative waveform. So let us look into the positive part of the waveform now. There, there is the inspiratory part. The inspiratory flow could be of any of these patterns. It could be rectangular, sinusoidal, ascending ramp, descending ramp or exponential. The, uh, it is usually rectangular in the volume control mode, but it could take any, any, uh, any inspiratory flow pattern. But for the pressure control mode, it should either, it should always be a descending ramp or an exponential uh, type of a flow pattern only. In the normal spontaneous breath, we have this sinusoidal uh, flow pattern. So these are the various kinds of the inspiratory flow pattern. We should always remember that the pressure control mode always has a descending ramp or an exponential kind of the flow pattern. Whereas in the volume control mode, you could have any kind of the flow pattern. So what is the importance of these flow patterns? So in the volume control mode, we see here it is a uh, rectangular kind of the inspiratory flow pattern. In the pressure mode, it is a descending ramp kind of the uh, descending ramp kind of the inspiratory flow pattern. So if this is going to be an inspiratory flow pattern, let us look what happens to the pressure. So the LO part is the pressure. So we can see here in the volume control mode, the pressure keeps on increasing and it peaks at the end of the inspiration. Whereas in the pressure targeted mode, the pressure remains uniform throughout the inspiration. So we can also see with an example here. The same amount of tidal volume delivered, that's around 500 ml, with the same amount of the PEEP and the respiratory rate and all other parameters remaining the same. We can see here that the uh, square flow, square inspiratory flow pattern of the volume control mode with versus the uh, descending ramp uh, flow pattern of the pressure control mode. So for the same tidal volume and, uh, to be delivered with the same parameters uh, in the same patient, we can see here that the volume control mode requires a higher peak pressure as compared to the pressure control mode because of the flow pattern. So this decelerating flow pattern will deliver the same tidal volume with a lesser pressure. So having seen the pressure control mode, so what are the volume control mode and the pressure control mode, what way is your pressure support mode different? The difference comes in here. This is because of your expiratory trigger sensitivity. So in the pressure support mode, as compared to the pressure control mode, your flow does not come and return to the baseline. This is determined by your expiratory trigger sensitivity that is, that is set by us. So uh, what is this expiratory trigger sensitivity? It is usually set at 25% uh, by default in all the ventilators, but it could be changed. So expiratory trigger sensitivity means, so there is a peak inspiratory flow that is occurring when the inspiration happens. So at what percentage of the peak inspiratory flow do you want the ventilator to cycle from inspiration to expiration? So that is called as an expiratory trigger sensitivity. So if you're going to set this expiratory trigger sensitivity as 50%, and if the peak inspiratory flow generated by the patient is 80 liters per minute, then once 40 liters of flow is being achieved, the, uh, the uh, flow gets cycled from inspiration to expiration. So if you're going to set it as 25%, then around 20 liters of uh, flow, when 20 liters of flow is achieved, the flow uh, cycles from inspiration to expiration. So this is called as an expiratory trigger sensitivity. This is possible only in the pressure support mode. Here, we tell that the flow cycling occurs and here the cycling is done by the patient because the in this, this, this amount of the flow that is being delivered to the patient depends upon the inspiratory effort that the patient has or the patient, the amount of the inspiratory flow that the patient takes. So depending upon the expiratory trigger sensitivity, the flow gets cycled from inspiration to expiration. So here the flow cycling has the component of the patient effort also. Another point to be noted is, as you keep on increasing the expiratory trigger sensitivity, we can see here that the inspiratory time gets shortened and the expiratory time gets prolonged. So as you keep on increasing your 
expiratory trigger sensitivity or inspiratory time gets shorted and your expiratory time gets prolonged. Having seen the inspiratory part of this waveform, let us now see the expiratory part of the waveform. What are the points to be considered when you are seeing the expiratory part of the waveform? We'll have to see the peak expiratory flow. We'll have to see the slope of the expiratory limb, the expiratory time, and always see if your expiratory waveform touches the baseline. So here we can see the dotted one is supposed to be the normal uh, expiratory waveform. With the actual expiratory waveform, we can see here it does not touch the baseline. So if this is the case, then it could be autopeak. In some amount of air is still retained in the patient's lungs. It is not completely expired. So always never forget to look into the expiratory part of the waveform and determine the four parameters. After administration of the bronchodilator, so we can see here there is an improved peak expiratory flow and the expiratory time is also shortened. So this shows a good response to your bronchodilator therapy. Having seen the flow time scalar, let us now see the pressure time scalar. So this is how the pressure time scalar looks in the volume mode under the pressure mode. So this is the flow time scalar and this is your pressure time scalar. So we can see here the flow time in the flow time in the volume control mode, the flow time scalar has the square wave pattern as we discussed earlier. And in the pressure control mode, it has the descending ramp kind of a waveform. Uh, whereas the pressure, the pressure time scalar in the volume mode has this shark fin appearance, whereas in the pressure mode it has the square waveform because we have determined the pressure. So when we press the inspiratory hold button in the volume control uh, mode, so we can see a plateau pressure appearing in the pressure time scalar. So this will be your peak pressure. On pressing the inspiratory hold button, we get to see the plateau pressure. So this is, these are your peak pressures. On pressing the inspiratory hold button, we get to see the plateau pressure in the volume control mode. So we do have some goals that we set up for uh, mechanical ventilation. So we, uh, we tend to limit our ventilation so that we don't exceed the peak inspiratory pressure beyond 40 or the plateau pressure beyond 30. So uh, what, is the, what is the importance of this peak inspiratory pressure and the plateau pressure? This difference between the peak inspiratory pressure and the plateau pressure is determined by the airway resistance. And the difference between the plateau pressure and the PEEP is determined by the pulmonary compliance. So this difference is determined by the resistance. Airway resistance meaning the flow of the air through the airways. And this part between the plateau pressure and the PEEP, this difference is governed by the compliance of the lung. So here we can see this part, the difference between the peak inspiratory pressure and the plateau pressure. So if this difference by this equation, we can see if this difference is determined by the flow and the resistance. So if this difference has to increase, it will be because of increased resistance or because of increased flow. Increased resistance meaning because of bronchospasm, because of any secretions occluding the tube or uh, any secretions in the circuit, clogged HME filters or kinking or uh, kinking of the ET tubes, etc. Or because of increased flow also. So when this difference is more, the plateau pressure minus PEEP. So with this equation, we can see when the plateau pressure minus PEEP, this part is, this pressure is more, then it could be only because of a reduced compliance or an increased tidal volume. So increased tidal volume because of the increased flow and the reduced compliance could be either because of the reduced compliance of the lung as in ARDS, pneumonia, etc. Or reduced compliance of the chest wall as in obesity, pneumoperitoneum, etc. So whenever there is high peak pressure, so what should we do? The application of your pressure time scalar comes in here. So whenever there is an increase, if this is supposed to be your normal peak inspiratory pressure, if there is an increased peak inspiratory pressure, you'll have to press the inspiratory hold button and determine what the plateau pressure is. If the plateau pressure is normal, then the difference between your peak pressure and your plateau pressure is going to be more. Then in that case, you'll have to look in for causes of increased airway resistance as in bronchospasm, kinked tubes or secretions, etc. If the plateau pressure is also raised and this difference is unchanged, then this could be because of a compliance-related issue. Then look for compliance-related issues like pneumothorax, pneumonia, ARDS, etc. So this is the troubleshooting for your high peak airway pressures. This elevated baseline could also be because of your autopeak. If all these are normal, then look in for autopeak also. Here we can see 
the peak pressure and the plateau pressure peak pressure is raised the peak and the plateau pressure difference is almost zero so here the difference is almost zero so the issue here is going to be because of decreased compliance because the plateau pressure per se is more wherein here we can see peak pressure is 42 whereas plateau is 14 so the plateau is normal but this difference is more so here the increased peak uh, peak airway pressure is mainly because of increased airway resistance other applications of your pressure time scale are wind determining the auto peak so i'm pressing the inspiratory hold button we get to see the uh, plateau pressure when we press your expiratory hold button whatever the pressure that we are getting above the peak that will be the auto peak so expiratory hold button on applied will give you the auto peak so that will be the amount of peak that is over and above the set peak so that will be the auto peak auto peak means the some amount of air that is trapped in the lung that is giving the, you the extra peak the patient's effort can also be seen as a negative deflection in the pressure time scalar it could be below the baseline or below the peak line or as a negative deflection so this pressure time scalar can be used to determine the trigger also so when when the patient's effort is uh, fair enough or it has reached the threshold that we have set to trigger the uh, assisted breath then an assisted breath will be triggered so you can see once the patient generates a negative pressure you can see the deflection here happening in the flow waveform and in the volume waveform also a, a supported breath or an assisted breath is triggered then another important application or a recent application of the pressure time scalar is evaluation of the stress index so what is stress index so this has been published recently in a journal in respiratory care in 2018 so uh, here the authors state that we we'll have to we we'll have to draw a tangent in the um, pressure time scalar so they state that when your when your volume is constant so during con when the when the flow is constant when this flow is constant the rate of change of the airway pressure parallel the rate of change of your respiratory compliance so when your uh, flow is being constant we'll have to mark the tangent in your pressure time scalar we'll mark the midpoint and draw a tangent in the pressure time scalar so once we draw the tangent if you want to see the downward concavity So, if you want to see a downward concavity, or you can see an upward concavity, or it could be linear. So, we're going to see the downward concavity. So, if uh, then it means the stress index is less than one. So, here we'll have to apply PEEP and we'll have to increase your recruitment to make the stress index. Uh, we'll have to go. Our goal will be to achieve the stress index equal to one. So, if the stress index is more than one, we'll be seeing upward concavity. Then it means there is over distension. So, here we'll have to reduce the PEEP. So, during constant flow. we we'll have to mark the tangent so if the stress index is 1 it is normal so if its stress index is more than 1 then it means upward concavity or over distension which less than 1 then we'll have to increase the peep here and we'll have to reduce the peep here here we can see in this patient uh here the stress index was less than 1 and there is a downward concavity here so this was a patient uh, who was an early ards so on application of peep we can see the stress index has closer to 1 the stress index has improved on application of peep this is another patient who was in late ards we can see here there is an upward concavity here the stress index more than 1 so here on reduction of the peep the stress index has become uh, closer to 1 and it has been improved so the stress index is used to stabilize the lung on a breath to breath basis by allowing optimum personalization of the peep so there is an application of the stress index in estimating the amount of peep that is required having seen flow time scalar and the pressure time scalar now let's go to the volume time scalar uh, volume time scalar uh, helps us to know the inspiration and the expiration if we add in an inspiratory pause then we can see a truncated appearance in the top it helps us to determine the tidal volume and every time we'll have to see if your exhaled volume returns back to your baseline if it's not returning back to your baseline then looking for any leaks possible leaks in the endotracheal tube the circuit or any chest strain in place so this completes your ventilator scalars so we have seen the flow volume and the pressure and how are we to determine the resistance and the compliance so this is the equation of motion so the we the controllables could either be on the right, left hand side or on the right hand side so if you are going to control this side 
So then here we can see the pressure is a, a thing which is not controlled. So any change that happens here, so because this is controlled, this side is controlled now. So this is volume control ventilation. So what will happen is any change that is happening here because of the change in the elastance. Increased elastance means reduced compliance. So if there is any reduced compliance or an increased resistance, so the volume delivered to the patient is not going to change because you have controlled that, you have set that. So the volume delivered is not going to change. When what will happen? The pressure will be the variable. So in the volume control ventilation, the pressure is going to be the variable. Your volume waveform will not change. So we can see here in the volume control mode, you have already set the particular volume. You have already set the flow. So your flow or the volume is not going to change. If there is any change in the airway resistance or in the compliance, the only thing that could change will be your pressure. So if there is an increased resistance or a reduced compliance, your pressure is going to build up. Your pressure will raise. Whereas in the pressure control waveform, we are controlling this part. So this part cannot change. This part is going to be static. So here, is, here we are setting up the pressures. So this part is going to be static. So if there is any change in the compliance or in the resistance, the volume delivered will reduce. So if there's going to be an increased resistance or a reduced compliance, the volume delivered will be in, will be the one that is going to be changed. So we can if, if the, the pressure waveform will not change here, the flow and the volume waveform will be could, could change in the pressure controlled ventilation. The pressure support ventilation is also similar to the pressure control ventilation, except for that uh, it is being triggered by the patient and flow cycled, as we saw earlier. So having seen the scalars, now let's come to the uh, loops. Let's come to the pressure volume loop. Um, and loops are, uh, what are loops? As we saw earlier, loops are the two scalars that are plotted against each other. So uh, they are called as loops because they end at the same point where they begin. So coming to the pressure volume loop. So it's pressure versus volume. You have volume here and pressure in the x-axis. So if it is a mandatory breath or a uh, controlled breath, what happens? There is a positive pressure in inspiration. So it is going to be positive pressure and the tidal volume is going to increase. It's a positive pressure inspiration and an expiration returning back to the baseline. So this is how the pressure volume loop appears in the mandatory breath. If it's going to be an assisted breath, it will be an initial negative pressure because the assisted breath is being triggered by the patient. So it's going to be a negative pressure initially then that is being assisted by the positive pressure of the ventilator, which then returns back to the baseline. So this is how the assisted breath looks in the pressure volume loop. In a spontaneous breath, it's, the whole of the inspiration is going to be negative and the expiration will be positive. So this is how a spontaneous breath looks in the pressure volume loop. So what is compliance? Compliance means the distensibility. So for the, for the given pressure, how well uh, the lung can expand or anything can expand. So here we, here we can see in these two balls, the pressure applied is around 25 centimeters of water. But what is the volume that is being uh, pumped in? In this ball, it is around 300 ml versus this ball, which is 500 ml, which is more compliant. Obviously, this is more compliant than this because for the same amount of pressure, more amount of volume is being held by this ball. So this is how a normal lung will behave. And this is how in a less compliant lung will behave. Less compliant lung as in ARDS or pneumonia will behave. So the distensibility of the lung becomes lesser or you need more pressure to deliver the same tidal volume. So with, the com with this concept of compliance in mind, uh, let us see the compliance curve. Even in the uh, even in the healthy lung, the compliance is not a linear, a linear one. So if you want to plot the tidal volume versus pressure, you won't get a linear uh, curve. Your compliance curve will be like the sigmoid shape. It is because of the differential uh, uh, distensibility of the alveoli and the different zones of the lung and the different capacities, uh, the different zones operating at different uh, capacities. So we can see here that the compliance is maximum in this portion, that is mid portion. That is the, that is the portion wherein just above your FRC. So that is the area wherein your compliance is highest. When you are going below your FRC, your compliance is less. And we're going to go over above your uh, uh, the higher part of your vital capacity also, your compliance is going to be less. So just around your FRC, that is the area we can see for the same pressures, the tidal volume generated will be more. So it's always important for us to have your ventilation around your FRC. So you have to, you have to you should always have 
keep your alveoli open just around your FRC. This pressure volume loop on a healthy lung also shows hysteresis. What is hysteresis meaning? Uh, lesser amount of pressure is required uh, to hold the uh, alveolus for the same tidal volume uh, during expiration as compared to inspiration. So this is because of the effect of a surfactant and the elastic recoil capacity of the lung also. So this is called as hysteresis. And here also we can see the compliance part. The compliance is low at lower lung volumes because of the increased surface tension. And the compliance is also low at higher lung volumes because the elastic capacity of stretchability of the lung is Reached. So the high compliance is just around your FRC. And this hysteresis is not there in a liquid filled lung because of the, uh, because there's no role for the surface tension there. So it is only there in, uh, in the air uh, filled lung because of the air surfactant interface. So that is the reason we get to have the hysteresis and because of your elastic recoil tendency of the lung also. So this uh, gives us two points, the inflection points, lower and the upper uh, inflection points. So these points are important because beneath the lower inflection point, the alveolar recruitment is uh, not there and there's increased uh, airway resistance and reduced compliance. And above your upper inflection point, also peaking and over distension occurs and high peak airway pressure occurs. So we'll have to hear, opt we'll have, this is a zone of optimal compliance wherein we'll have to operate. So this is the part of the uh, lung wherein the alveoli are happily distended. They are, they are stretched beyond this, uh, causing over distension and increased peak airway pressures. So this is your safe zone, the zone of optimal complaints. And this corresponds to the stress index of one that we saw when we discussed the pressure time scalar. So this zone of alveolar collapse corresponds to your stress index less than one and over distension corresponds to stress index more than one. So always to maintain our uh, ventilation in this zone of optimal compliance, we'll have to have optimal PEEP and we should not uh, go for higher tidal volumes also. So that, that, that is when the lung protective ventilation strategies have come in. So wherein we, we have an optimal PEEP so that we don't allow the alveolar to get completely collapsed. So the optimal PEEP is determined by your uh, lower inflection point and we tend, to, uh, we tend to keep our tidal volumes such that we don't breach the upper inflection point and cause alveolar over distension. So these are the two factors that we'll have to uh, keep in mind when ventilating the patient are uh, the optimal peak and that we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't what pump in more tidal volume uh, to breach the uh, upper inflection point and cause too much of uh, peaking or over distension. So this is how the pressure volume loop uh, is seen in various modes of ventilation. In the uh, volume control mode, the volume is targeted here. So if there is going to be any change in the uh, respiratory compliance, if there's going to be any reduction in the respiratory compliance because the volume is uh, limited here, then the then it will be the, the curve will be shifting towards your right. Whereas in the pressure control mode here, the pressure is limited. So if there is going to be any uh, reduced compliance, then the volume delivered will become lesser. So here in the... Uh, volume control mode, if there is any reduced compliance, as we saw, it will be shifted towards your right. Whereas in the uh, pressure control mode, if there is any reduction in the compliance, we can see here, the tidal volume delivered becomes lesser. The work of breathing can also be estimated using the pressure volume loop. So this part shows the resistive inspiratory work and this part shows the resistive expiratory work and this is your elastic work. So on seeing the pressure volume loop, we can determine where the work of breathing gets increased also. So if there is an uh, if there is if the patient has got bronchospasm, then the expiratory work is increased. The resistive expiratory work is increased. So we can see this part of the this part instead of coming in here, the work done becomes more. The resistive expiratory work done is more. If there is any kinking of the tube, then both the inspiratory resistive work and the expiratory resistive work are increased. So the loss of tidal volume can be seen here also as an open loop. And if there's a very increased compliance as an in emphysema, we can see the curve shifted towards your left. So now about the flow volume loops. The normal flow volume loop, as we see in a, a spirometry, is just opposite to what we see in the ventilator waveform. Because uh, in the spirometry, when the patient is uh, breathing spontaneously at all, uh, the inspiratory waveform is seen down and the expiratory waveform is seen in the top. Wherein here, 
when you are giving positive pressure ventilation, the inspiratory waveform is seen on the top and the expiratory waveform is seen below. So this is used, uh, the, the, flow, uh, the flow volume loop is used to determine the peak inspiratory flow, the peak expiratory flow, and also the tidal volume. The inspiratory part of the flow, flow volume loop exactly mirrors the uh, the, insp the the inspiratory uh, flow pattern of the uh, inspiratory flow pattern of the flow time scalar. So in the volume control mode, wherein your flow time scalar has got a square waveform, your flow volume loop also will have the same uh, same kind of the pattern in the inspiratory part. Whereas in the pressure control mode, wherein we have the descending ramp kind of the waveform, the flow uh, volume loop also has the same kind of a Wave, same kind of a shape in the inspiratory part. The applications are, if there is any, if it's not returning to the baseline, then it could be because of air trapping and air leak can also be made out. A response to the bronchodilator can also be made out. If this is going to be a normal uh, flow, flow volume loop, you can see in bronchoconstriction, the peak expiratory flow rate is reduced and there is a, a scalloping of the expiratory waveform or an administration of the bronchodilator, the expiratory peak expiratory flow rate has improved and the scalloping is also is improved. The other applications are uh, any loss in tidal volume, secretions can be made out and uh, uh, obstructive airway disease, obstructive airway disease with uh, air trapping. All these could be made out using your flow volume loops also. So let's evaluate our understanding. So as we, um, as we see a uh, 12 lead ECG, Instead of just seeing one strip, uh, even though one strip can give you a diagnosis, the 12 lead ECG is more comprehensive or more supportive in your diagnosis. Similarly, instead of just seeing one scalar or one loop, we are going to see the all the scalars and all the loop. It gives us a more comprehensive idea. So here we can see what is happening. Here we can see what is happening. What what is the could you guess what the issue here is? So it depicts air leak. So here we can see in the pressure time scalar, the airway pressure that is being, uh, the, there's a decreased uh, peak inspiratory pressure because of the leak. And we can see there is a decreased peak expiratory flow also. The tidal volume is also not returning to the baseline. And in the uh, pressure volume loop also, we can see that it is not coming and touching the baseline. And in the uh, flow volume loop also, we can see the loss of tidal volume. We can exactly point out how much of tidal volume is being lost also. So always look into the uh, ventilator scalars and loops as a whole too. So our goal should be to make the ventilator breathe like the patient and not the other way around. So always try to understand what those waveforms are trying to tell to us. And uh, this is because the waveforms are the ones that tell us why such things are happening. Okay. So always remember the goal to make the ventilator breathe like the patient and not the other way around. Thank you.